now, back live with Andrew Bolt with the Bolt Report. South Australia's Labor government believes in global warming so much that it actually forced two coal-fired power stations out of business. One was even blown up. South Australia now is dangerously reliant on wind power instead. And that's why it's got the country's highest electricity prices. And that's why it's had two huge blackouts recently. One when the winds simply died. Now, this will get even worse because Victoria will in two weeks lose its giant Hazelwood coal-fired station. Also, thanks to global warming policies. That's 20% of Victoria's electricity gone and South Australia's back up as well. So, South Australia's Premier, Jay Witherall, today announced a rescue package. We have a national electricity market which is failing not only South Australia, but failing the nation. This extraordinary state of affairs, uh, where our abundant solar, wind and gas resources leads this nation into an energy crisis. You didn't add our huge coal resources too. But anyway, South Australia will now build Australia's biggest battery system, just enough to keep a small town going for a couple of hours. It will force the national electricity system to give South Australia more electricity in a crisis. It will also build a government-owned gas-fired plant for when the wind does die. There's a sudden reduction in... Uh the generation capacity of wind or solar, it would provide stabilisation services to the South Australian grid. All up cost $550 million to fix what the South Australian government's stupid global warming policies broke. Well, joining me is the panel, former Labor Minister and power broker Graham Richardson and John Roskam, head of the Institute of Public Affairs. John. Has the South Australian uh, government now fixed the problem it caused by scrapping coal-fired or coal-fired power? They haven't fixed anything, Andrew. The federal government got this right today. This is nonsense. There's a couple of issues with what the South Australian government is doing. It won't provide secure energy. It's energy at least twice the cost of coal. And you mentioned the 100 megawatt uh, battery storage the government is planning. That's equivalent to about 1,500 electric car batteries. Um, <laughs> This is a disaster. <laughs> this is not the way forward for South Australia or for the rest of the country. Honestly, uh, Graham, when I was looking at Jay Witherall give the press conference, to be perfectly frank, I saw the eyes of a zealot who would not brook any challenge to this global warming madness that has lent, led uh, the state into this pickle. Now, listen, for, let's go for a start. This, uh, these, these batteries to uh, prop the uh, system up to store some of the power for when the wind doesn't blow. Why didn't it think of this before, Graham, before in having installed 40% of the state's power from just wind? But I don't know, because it's completely worthless, whether they thought of it now or before. It doesn't change anything. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that Tesla fellow, by the way, Musk, whatever his name is, he ought to be heading home and trying to fix up his own company. They're losing billions. They'd be lucky to be existing by the end of the year. So. It strikes me as being very strange you take advice from someone who's really struggling and you take a bit of advice that, as you said earlier on, would only keep a small town going for a few days. This is not going to a solve... A few hours. A if, couple of hours, Graham. Just a couple of hours. Well, it's, it's not going to fix anything that happens in, in, uh, uh, in South Australia. And, you know, they're, they're blaming, and this is the sad thing, they're, they're blaming that, you know, we don't get enough out of the national electricity market. They're, their treasurer, or Tom Kusinatis, who's had a lot of ministries down there, uh, he said last year that they were the lead legislator on it. They thought it was terrific. They had people whose uh, lives had been dedicated to it. They were really happy with it. Now it's to blame for everything that's gone wrong. It's not, of course. They made a huge error, went too far down the uh, renewables path, and now have no idea how to fix it. And I tell you what, that today's stuff about the batteries was just about the last straw for me. I try and stick up for <laughs> Labor everywhere, but this is getting really too tough for me. Oh, look, it's obvious, you know, the Greens go around saying, batteries will solve, batteries will solve, the Elon Musk coming, oh, more batteries, I'll have more batteries. But clearly, John, batteries aren't the answer, because otherwise they would have done more of them. They, it's, it's a token, because what they've really done, the key here is build, they're building their own gas plant. Their own gas plant, That's mind right. you, which is unusual. 
and, and will force other states to give South Australia more of their That's power right. as well in a crisis. And we've got the situation of this being hugely expensive. Gas doesn't right. provide base load and we can connect what South Australia is doing to what happened on the weekend. It's highly significant. WA Labor won a major election victory by walking away from re renewable energy targets. Federal Labor is walking away from those targets. South Australia is digging itself further into a hole on these targets. Well, the thing is, Graham, like I say, there was the, the eyes of a zealot in Jay Weatherill today. He has got this global warming religion. He cannot admit to error. He used to believe, by the way, in, uh, in banning uranium. Now he doesn't. So he got that one wrong. Now he's got another faith. Have a listen to him when someone asked him, and he gave the same, basically the same answer about three times, why don't you simply open one of the two coal-fired power stations that you guys closed? Here he is. Have a listen. What we have here is an ageing coal-fired power station that couldn't guarantee its capacity to gain the fuel necessary at an economic price to secure its future. That's, that's the past. They don't want it, Graham, not really because it's more expensive, because their solutions are even more expensive, but because it emits carbon dioxide. Isn't it time to draw a line under this madness? Well, I'd, I'd draw a line under it this way. I mean, I don't think I'd, I'd reopen one of their power stations. Why go back to old brown coal technology anyway? But here in New South Wales and Queensland, why can't we build a few new ones quickly, straight away, now, with new technology that, that, that I don't say it's clean, but it's much cleaner. So it doesn't matter where you stand on global warming, you've got to say it's a step forward. But one thing's for certain, you've no, got you to guarantee supply, and they won't. They, I mean, none of these things that, that uh, you, you've heard from Weatherall today guarantee supply. And if you're Olympic Dam, or you're the smelter out uh, it, you know, in the bush, wherever you are, you know you've got to have reliable power, or they're going to walk away. And these people will not provide an, even any guarantee or any certainty. And I... I'm staggered by it, and you know the fact that things, the lights went out when Adele was on last night, is just a, a harbinger of things to come. <laughs> well, someone just tripped over a power cord. Yeah, or something I know. There, but symbolic. But symbolic. only in South Australia listen, would that happen. Uh, I'm from South Australia, so uh, I better not. I've got to go back there now and then, so I better not say anything. But John. Um, the thing about this is, uh, Graham says uh, coal, new coal-fired, clean coal, so, the so-called technology, that actually costs an absolute bomb. The whole point for me, the underlining this whole insanity is this. No matter what we do, it actually makes no difference to global warming. Australia's emissions are too small. All this pain that you're going through, these hoops that the, the Premier is going through, all this expense, this half a billion dollars now, it's for nothing. Why don't politicians say so? because they're not going to overturn 20 years of ideology, Andrew. There's one thing I'd say about uh, efficient uh, coal-fired power stations. The cost is coming down all the time. There's more than 1,500 in operation around the world now. More are being built every month. Uh, we have thousands of years of coal available. We have 30% of the world's uranium supplies. Uh, well, rather and, than build one of these new beautiful power stations, why are we putting out of business, something like Hazelwood, well, that's 20% exactly. of Victoria's And power. the irony of it Hello. is that's South, cheap. Austra That'd South be Australia is happy to take Victoria's electricity Correct. from coal. Correct. But um, the other thing, uh, before we uh, go, move on uh, to something else, Graham, it's also going to, South Australia also said today, it's going to step up gas exploration, right? Gas exploration, because if it doesn't do that, its new gas-fired power station won't have anything to use, any fuel. The irony here is that in Victoria, all gas exploration on land has been banned. In New South Wales, fracking, which has unlocked huge supplies in uh, the US, has been banned over most of the territory. And in all the territories, it's been banned completely. What is going on with Australia's insane energy policy that we're banning stuff that works? I think one of the craziest things is this whole thing on gas. Um, I mean, obviously we're sending most of our gas overseas anyway. It seems to me we've got to earmark some for here, but the coal seam gas strategy has to be looked at again because it's, it's too big a source to ignore. But don't forget, and I think it's pretty important, you know, the industry has a, has a lot to answer for. You know, the, the old marching through the farm gate, whether they liked it or not, and just doing things, created an enormous resentment in rural Australia. 
And a, a lot of people have been able to, you know, clamp down on that and use it. And I think, you know, the industry needs to have a good look at itself anyway. But look, if we don't revisit these things, we're going to be in all sorts of strife. And I, I sit back and I wonder why governments don't do obvious things. These are not things that, are, that you need to be a genius to work out. It's just obvious you've got to do it and no one will. In Victoria, it is a joke that there's no expiration. How can you justify none? <laughs> It's just, you can't, Graham, and they haven't even bothered to do it. It's, it's just the green lobby is just so crazy and people don't seem to be resisting it. But, John, uh, One Nation, the vote in Western Australia now uh, is about 8%, right? In the seats that contested in the lower house and in the council, the upper house, where it concentrates their focus, nearly 8%. It's winning probably about two seats there. Pauline Hanson uh, just tells me I don't know whether it's true or not, but she reckons three, maybe four. What do you reckon? Did it fail, as so many journalists have claimed, in the last election? I'm, I'm not quite sure One Nation failed, and more important than One Nation uh, are the voices that One Nation represents. So we've spoken about gas and energy and electricity. Um, if you are, for example, a climate change sceptic, or if you believe that perhaps uh, the climate change concerns are exaggerated, uh, the Labor Party believes the same thing. The Liberal Party believes the same thing. Uh, one Nation is one of the places you might go to vote. So, um, if one only to prize open that consensus. Exactly. Let's take freedom of speech. Let's take the, the concern about Islamic terrorism. Uh, one Nation certainly underperformed the West Australian election, but uh, the concerns of the voters of One Nation are not are going anywhere. But Graham, John is still saying that One Nation underperformed. And if you have a look at some of the polls, at one stage it was cruising to a 13% uh, primary vote and it got eight. But if I had said to you, Graham, without knowing everything, you know, everything here, two years ago, before Hanson was in the Senate, if I'd said to you, Graham, within two years, One Nation will have two seats, maybe three, in the upper house in uh, Western Australia, not even in Queensland, in Western Australia, and it will have eight percent of the vote, would you have said, my goodness, or is that all? I, I, I think I'd have been staggered to think it would come true, but I think the Hanson phenomenon has been that, a phenomenon. It's not something you experience very often. But the meteoric rise ended in Western Australia. She had a shocking week. She demonstrated with the, the stuff on vaccinations and Putin and things that she really does struggle when it, when it comes to giving opinions that someone hasn't written out for her. I mean, if she stuck to the questions she asked, which caused people to worry and, 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 and gets fear campaigns underway, then she's really on, on firm ground and she can last. But as soon as she ventures, ventures forth, she's in big trouble. And I think she showed how weak she can be. When the crunch comes, she just doesn't have the intellect to make it. And I think that's been demonstrated. I think it's hurt her. Can she rebuild? Probably. But will she ever get to the... Sort of, I, I thought, Andrew, to be honest, that, that they'd get 15% in Western Australia. Uh, uh, that's if you go back five or six weeks. And uh, I thought in Queensland they, they'd be getting 25 to 30 I'm not now sure she can do that. I think she's been brutally hurt uh, and mortally wounded, and whether she can survive on those numbers is another question. But she's still, when you think about it, the Greens are still on 10% after 35 years. She's on 8% after one. Now, they're on eight there. In West Australia, there, she's just over overtaken them. Uh, she's on about eight in the upper house and they're on just under. So she's actually now the third biggest party. That's why I think, it, I, th I agree, she's been wounded, I agree. But I don't think she's been fatally wounded, John. Uh, just quickly in the 30 seconds we uh, have got left, she stepped up in her interview, I thought, the criticism of T Malcolm Turnbull. That seems to be one lesson she's learned. She's going to put some distance now. And the Liberal Party will put some distance from One Nation too. Both parties were hurt by the preference deal. I don't think it drove the Liberal Party vote down to 30%. It was already there. But Graham is right. Pauline Hanson or any party, any minor party, has to speak to the issues of concern to people, not talk and about Vladimir Putin. all that stuff, like the uh, Royal Commission to Islam. John Roskam and Graham Richardson, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Andrew.